Good evening. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Royal Drawing School's Creative Conversation Series. Tonight, we're going to be exploring experiential drawing and thinking about drawing as ephemeral experience rather than as an act of permanent mark making. To set the scene for us, we will have a short introduction uh, to the field of experiential art with Coralie von Bismarck, who is the Director of Sales and Artist Management at Superblue, a new enterprise dedicated to supporting artists and engaging audiences with experiential art. Then we're going to hear from artists working in, in this field, Random International and Simon Hygens, who will be exploring how drawing features in their respective practices and focusing on two works where light is the pre primary medium. So to introduce our artists a little further, Random International was founded in 2005 by Hannes Koch and Florian Ortkras and is a Berlin and London-based collaborative studio for experiential, experimental practice. As AI, biotech and robotics become rapidly and deeply ingrained in the automation of daily life, their work aims to stimulate wider reflection on the responsive relationships with intangible technologies that underscore the world, while often leaving the question of who is in control open and ambiguous. Random International is best known for Rain Room, which premiered at the Barbican in London in 2012, an interactive artwork in which the audience remains completely dry while walking through a continuous downpour. Joining them uh, is Simon, whose work reinterpret reinterprets natural processes with unique technologies and embeds these in man-made surroundings to create mechanisms that reveal the hidden essence of a place. Meteorological conditions, including sunlight and wind, custom algorithms, as well as human interactions, transform the artist's responsive artworks in real time, creating ever-changing forms. And his work is featured in permanent collections around the world, including the Museum of Modern Art in New York, uh, the Art Institute of Chicago, and the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. So welcome to you all. Um, and as, as always, before we begin, just to remind everyone listening uh, that you're welcome to leave comments and questions uh, in, the, in the chat and Q&A box, and um, we'll be kind of answering them as we go and at the end. So, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Hello. I... <clears throat> Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for having us. <laughs> and then the great thoughts. Um, yes, Coralie, do you want to just set the scene for us and kind of yes. introduce Super Blue? Yeah. In the um, thank you so much for including us. It's very uh, uh, exciting to be part of this creative community. Um, so about Super Blue, um, it's a new enterprise which we launched um, last year, but it has been in the making um, for several years. And um, it, it's rooted in the gallery world. So it was founded by Mark Lynch and Molly Dent Brocklehurst from Pace Gallery. But it's very much designed to champion artist ideas beyond the traditional gallery context. So um, we work with artists who move away from the idea of art as an object. Um, they create large scale installations, environments, or performative artworks that often speak to preferences invite the viewer for participation. And um, this actually builds on um, a tradition of artists such as James Terrell or, or Robert Irvin, who were, who were pioneers in the, in the fields um, back in the 60s, and who were very much interested in sensory perception and the effects of light, and um, also saw an inherent connection between scientific research and, and art. So, um, this approach is, is continued by the artist, uh, artists that we work with, such as Simon and, and Random. And they really embrace new technologies as tools and, and um, draw from different sets of expertise to, to create their work. And um, well, experiential art has been around for a long time. Um, there was never really a commercial model um, or support system to um, that was built around the specific requirements of these types of productions. So at SuperBlue, we are trying to fill that gap and we work on new business models and opportunities uh, for these artists to um, sustain their studios and invest all their energy into, into um, producing new work. So 
we have our own experiential art centers um, that we are opening up um, and we actually open our first one uh, tomorrow in Miami. So tickets will go on sale tomorrow morning. Um, and um, where we um, commission artists to uh, work on exhibitions and we kind of switch the business model around because the artists um, receive a share um, of the ticket revenue and nothing that you see is actually on, on, on sale for to individual collectors. So it's, it's a different model to what you see in the, in the more traditional um, gallery world. And um, we also, beyond our art centers, we also work on projects in the public realm and we've done art and architecture commissions and um, we are working on, on digital um, commissions. So that space is something that we're building out at the moment. And um, what I find interesting about the artists that we work with is that they all come from very different backgrounds. So we have architects, we have artists who have gone through a very traditional art education. Some come from performance, from stage design, um, from film or even gaming. And um, they are all united in, in, in the ambition to work in more immersive ways and, and putting the audience um, at the center of, of their work. Um, which results in installations that are never static and, and are constantly evolving. Um, and uh, to sum up uh, and kind of on the, on, on the note of the ephemeral nature of these works, I wanted to um, quote another artist um, who works with us, who's S. Devlin, and she described the practice beautifully. She said, we find new ways to sculpt and carve light and our work endures in memories and synaptic sculptures in the minds of those who were once present in the audience. <laughs> Over to you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so, um, Random International, do you want to start us off? I know you've got some images and some moving, moving image to, to share with us and to hear a bit more about your projects. Oh, I was muted, wasn't I? Thank you, Coralie, for the nice introduction. Um, and yes, good evening, everybody. Um, we are going to race through a bunch of slides because we really want this to be a conversation event with um, Simon. <clears throat> we are um, trying to make the mouse clicker work. Okay, here, here we go. We've divided this in three parts, um, racing through um, the, the different kinds of drawing that we deploy and employ in, in our studio. I'm starting a bit <clears throat> with a sort of um, historic view on how we started out. We based pretty much, it's fair to say, we based our studio on, on some kind of drawing in the first couple of years. Um, we continue to this day to increasingly use this in our, uh, use drawing in our practical processes, in our artistic processes, uh, both for communication, internal, external, but also for clarification. Um, we thereby also redefine for us the, the, what we call sketching and drawing. Um, flow in particular is uh, an extremely artistic user of um, 3D modeling. So we, we or he uses that intensely to sketch. I use more the iPad pencil sketch thing, which was a revolutionary breakthrough for for us to have that to go back to sketching and then we go to the sort of uh, uh, full contact drawing as we call it the, the stuff where we develop really immersive drawing uh, environments where people can use their entire body to, to draw and sculpt so um, this is temporary graffiti it's basically light drawing tools which we developed since 2005 um, 2006 uh, started out with events like this this is in the tape modern temporary uh, light sources, UV light sources on glow-in-the-dark substrate. Uh, these are incredible street artists, um, 3TT Man um, and Ramet, um, back in, in during the street art show in the, in the Tate Modern. <clears throat> and we did a, we did these, um, we, we built these environments for people and then gave people these toys and tools um, 
which we, in a very painstaking manner, sculpted uh, around real life, um, real life graffiti tools like spray cans and, and marker pens, these adding pens. And we had stand, stencils, we made draw furniture, furniture that was coated that you could draw on. Uh, this is like these aircraft grade aluminium spray cans. Um, and it was all literally all very basic UV light torches. Um, but it got people intensely in touch with their own creativity, very low inhibitions, uh, which made this, and we do this to this day, um, that, that people don't, they're not afraid to fail or fuck up because everything fades out after a couple of minutes, depending on, on what environment it's done on, but it's all extremely ephemeral. <clears throat> we started then automating the drawing process back in 2006, seven for exhibitions where we didn't want to be or couldn't be present. So we did pendulums on phosphorized surfaces um, and let, let, the, let sort of gravity draw for us. Um, we did that um, in, in, um, in many different, different iterations. Um, these ones you could actually grab, I think, and then uh, um, they had to, like an elastic, it was quite quite an in, uh, uh, intricate design. You could grab them and then draw yourself um, on, on the table and then they, they swung around. It was like a bar top uh, thing. Um, we did uh, then discovered, we, were, we got quite sick of this glow in the dark, night clubby feel. So explored other light reactive drawing substrates. This is a photochromic material which changes color um, when exposed to UV light. Um, and we did enormous amounts. We did machines that drew on it and, and so on um, back in 2006, seven, eight, and then pendulums for, this was an exhibition at Elaboral. Um, and then we optimized this in terms of drawing of, of we, we developed our own photochromic substrates. That was two, two years ago, I think 2019 for a show in Korea, where we brought the entire temporary graffiti thing into the light basically. So you could do this in, in not in daylight, not in sunlight, but you could do it in lit environments. And we developed a clear lacquer, which changes color. Uh, it keeps the color change for about 60 seconds or 50 seconds. So it's a very, um, uh, uh, it's it's a very ephemeral process, and this is a this is one of these drawing machines um, which we've got many iterations of over the years. This is the latest one called Presence and Erasure. This is a show we did in um, Paradise City in Korea with um, Pays Gallery and Superblue, um, and um, where we again we, we 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 instruct the machine to draw on our behalf. Um, that's the sort of, but that, that's the the that's what one body of work that our practice was built around, and this is the more sort of traditional procedural sketching processes where we use it to um, we use drawing to this is um, from start to finish. This covers about a year long process from a first meeting with Wayne McGregor uh, for a, a work that ended up being called Zoological. Um, this was 2016. Um, we met at the roundhouse and then started developing the idea for floating uh, swarm algorithmically driven spheres um, and started sketching them, started specifying, uh, talking to each other in the form of sketches and drawings. Um, and then um, uh, getting people with balloons into the space to prototype it. Uh, and then flow took over um, uh, uh, 3D modeling that like how all these sketches, if we actually put that into a space, maybe not the super Guggenheim-y wide, wide space, but how, how would it look? What materials are we using? So this, this is very much um, our way of sketching. We, this is a first, we approximate our and sharpen our thinking. We dismiss ideas. We develop ideas using this kind of these sketching methodologies. So maybe you can, um, explain a bit about also the, the sort of innovative steps for us in the in the rendering here with the with the characters and the, the films on the loop so it'll replay 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the nice, I think the nice step from sketching, like what you, what we usually call sketching, to what we then do, is like you don't lose the impossible stuff when you sketch. So you, you know, you still draw, and it could be, it could be something that doesn't actually work. Like this morning, I had a conversation with, um, uh, with one of our designers, and I had a beautiful idea. It's but it's completely impossible. <laughs> so, but but sometimes it's or it's it's really important to keep that alive as long as long as possible and then when you because as soon as you go into 3d or like a more technical um uh, software like an engineering software you like you very quickly see what you can't do anymore and i think with the step before where you have all the stuff to do that that are impossible without those to without exploring those uh you might you might like you might miss a really good uh, you might miss a really good idea um, and yeah and these these are kind of the first sketches where we uh, like uh, like uh, 3d rendered sketches where we actually look you know how would it how would it how would it how would it look how would what's the uh, here especially you know what are the volumes what do we need to create this kind of um, uh, the feeling of agency we want to um, uh, we want to create like like here for example they come much closer than they do in the end in reality but you know how would that but you look at it and you're like how would i feel within this so 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 between uh, between us and i and the uh, and the wider studio we look at these things obviously also from a feasibility point but but mainly like you know how would that how would that how would that be would that give you the the kind of uh, the impression of something being there that um, uh, that we want to do so we do obviously this is one that then actually can become reality but we have about uh, I don't know we have in the excess of 100 100 things for example that we get to this stage to uh, to have conversation to hope to hopefully develop um, at a later stage and this is really also I think it's it's a what's probably worth noting is that especially for like I do my sketching on a on an on an iPad with co- an app called Concepts, which I'm a huge fan of. It's just the right amount of enormous diversity, but also ease of use. I found it much easier to use than others, uh, and flows a rampant user of sketchbooks, like proper sketchbooks and pens, and just sketching, sketching, sketching before this stage. But I think that the the, the there is a there is a sketch stage in this which. Um, which we use also for, for internal conversation. But this one, for example, what, like what, what we heard first was like, never. They're never going to fly that fast. They're never going to move that fast. But you to, 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 uh, to fine tune something, um, it's good to put something like this in front of, of um, the wider team and say, is this, is this a thing? Can we do it? And, then, and, the, and usually we know it's going to be a no, but you know, you can, it's a fantastic conversation um conversation starts at these things and then we use sketching like this you know just because it's it's so often these these decisions have to be made quickly which scrim do you want as a backdrop the white one or the black one or the um you know do we want the orbs to be black or do we want it without scrim can you still see them and stuff so that's like quick i often ipad sketches on photographs really useful uh, really good to communicate um and then that is taken outside. We look at, um, we take these to suppliers. We 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 talk to suppliers. We test um, we test the the the, the flying flying orbs. Um, we use these three D models. So this is the actual first. That's now in the actual software that guides the flight. It's the flight control software for these orbs um, in the roundhouse that guides the guides the first pattern. Um, to, to see this is much more as you can see much more um, closer to the actual speed they can deliver um, this is a um, documentation of the um, uh, of the uh, of the actual install in the roundhouse um, of this of guys flying information um, and then you have um, you have the the full performance with dancers of the royal ballet. So this is sort of where the whole thing comes full circle from the first sketch 
to the to the performance with dances from the Royal Ballet and Studio Wayne McGregor and a, um, and a score from uh, Mark Pritchett, um, which was up for I think four weeks uh, in 2017, and to date has been the only time that it's been shown. Um, for those who have, who didn't see it, can you just tell us a bit more about the um, the performance or the, the context for it? Because it looks the images are really compelling, but I just wondered. Um, yes, sure. Um, uh, uh, so uh, wait, let me just. Um, well, yeah, maybe I'll just let the um, let this bit run. Um, so, so the uh, the entire idea is that that was behind that the, our ongoing investigation into collective behavior, into flocking, into algorithmically driven collective behavior of swarming, flocking of birds, insects, and so on. And we felt it was time, we've done that sort of studies in light, we've translated these algorithms into light installations predominantly. And for a long time, we had wanted to bring this into a kinetic, into a physical form, um, because we think it's interesting to see what happens to our instinctual and lived experience as human beings when algorithms and break the barrier between the purely digital world uh, the, uh, and break the barrier to, into our actual physical world, um, how, how that looks and feels. So that's why you saw in the in the first animations, you saw people being really immersed in those in those um, in those forms, which wasn't uh, uh, possible for technical slash health and safety reasons, but basically the 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 so this was for our sort of um, outgoing premise. How does it feel to meet a, a, a physical manifestation of an algorithmic being um, of a collective entity that that pretends to be sentient that shows it reacts to people it, it shows signs of curiosity. Uh, uh, well, it, it, all it does, it reacts to people and people then read into it the different kind of emotions, curiosity or fear or shyness and, and so on and so forth. And the, and the, what, together with Wayne, we found really interesting is to expose his dancers, the performers to a, a being that never is the same twice. So this wasn't a choreographed um, movement from from the from the spheres, they they did whatever they did every time different things. So uh, uh, so the the lighting stayed consistent over the the sort of whatever twenty performances or thirty performances, um, and the groups of people performing underneath was consistent. But what they had to be very much on their toes to see what the what the being was was uh, was doing. They had to they had to react to it because the being reacted to them. Um, so if you if you overlaid all these performances, there would be always a different way of, of movement in the space, and that that's something we found um, and still find very interesting to, to and, and try to you know amplify and zoom in on to, on this relationship between the human and the seemingly sentient uh, uh, machine, um, and that's essentially what we what we explored here. It's really fascinating yeah the improvisory nature of yeah both dance and the and and yeah very very interesting Those in, in, in this also again to try to, to anchor it a bit in, in sketching and, and drawing um super important because the, the 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 realization of this was of a nature that it was incredibly so the, the they're flying entirely autonomously um they are going back to their charging stations themselves on the first floor um, I, I don't know if you can see it, how they fly out in formation now. Yeah, they're going like, voot, voot. They're, they're going home, basically. There's nothing, uh, there's very little human input, funnily enough. It's called zoological because at the very beginning, we assumed you have to, we have to have, you know, so, some wardens, zoo wardens who grab them out of the sky to recharge them. But none of that, the machine took over, you know, it was all done automatically. Um, and the... It was incredibly to create the, the habitat where that could happen, i.e. all the cameras and, and so on and create those spheres was uh, so complex and expensive that we could only have it up for rehearsals for, I think, two days. So all that Wayne had from us for a year of preparation was sketches and renderings. He couldn't, you know, and simulations in, in 3D, but that was it. So he, his dancers could never rehearse in a physical space. Um, with the real thing until like two days before the premiere, which was um, 
which is, I guess, interesting. Um, how, how did they respond that's often, in those, in those? Uh, dab, I mean, you know, they love it. They love this stuff because it's very unscripted. You know, they, they get, they get, um, they get choreographic phrases and almost like a language assigned by Wayne and then they're on their own. And I think it, it empowers the, the, the individual performers um they they we tend to get very positive feedback because it's you know it's we're, we're not torturing them with hugely controversial or challenging um postures it's it's more it's a very emotional instinctual way of relating to these machines and and it relies really on their reaction and their own interpretation so um it's, it complements the the kind of ephemerality of dance as an art form in itself in some ways. Yeah, yes, there, there's there's not much you can, like in this one, there isn't much you can code and re-perform next time or something, uh, uh, not, not, not so easily because next time this will be performed, the code will have changed, updated, improved, uh, the behavior will have been refined. So there will be, the, 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 all they have is, is as a constant is, is a changing environment, definitely. And the behavior that you read into the dance and the and the movement of the um, of the objects that was really like that was, I think the, the most fascinating thing was that before we opened I think just before we opened there was someone like like we were walking through and uh, there was someone I think it was from the one of the staff he said like 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 and he said like oh you know like now nah, yeah, i get it this is the one that i that is a bit afraid this one really likes me that one doesn't like me and then i went up to up to our software engineer and i said did you change anything and i said no no they they all behave like they have they behave obviously with each other but they all have exactly the same the same pattern so just with slight changes you know we look at things and slight differences how something behaves we interpret uh, or we you know we try to analyze what we try to put meaning in you know a random movement because the brain wants to understand what's going um, um, what's going on and that's, I guess with with it's there was a nice thing between the fairly abstract dance moves and the movements on the movement of the machine and you kind of I think you relate in somewhere similar uh, similar to both Thank you. Yeah, there's a question from someone listening who's asking whether the dance was inspired by lighting or, or music. And I suppose, well, clearly by lighting, but was there music? Was there sound? Um, there was sound. There was a very um, uh, ambient score from uh, for, for War Brackets, Mark Pritchett, um, which was, it was very ambient. It wasn't like a sort of very choreographed mm -hmm. uh, or very scripted score was very it's it, it too changed you know it was a bit different every day and it was also running during the audience um during the audience uh, interaction and i think the i think that the the dance was m mostly inspired by the physicality of these orbs and how they behaved i think the lighting was there to support them to give a bit of theater theatrical sort of context and the music was there to give theatrical context to it. I think that the dance was thoroughly uh, focused on the interaction between the dancers, the individual and the machine or the duet and the machine and, and the group and the machines. Um, that was the, 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 the um, I think the focal point here. Um, last bit of sort of prototype sketching um that's a we, we then we then start sketching in real life that for us is a dra draft we had another idea doing that for one or one dancer for smaller iterations um and because we had the venue there we just tried it out and 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 made this little video just to to see how if you can reduce this group interaction to one organism uh in in a space and we um and that's sort of something which we collect and then years later probably we use that. We use this for, for a, a work called Cans of Life as a sort of some, some 
material to sort of research material for that how how would people interact with one single sphere what sort of behavior would we have to give to one uh one organism and so on and this for us again is a form of sketching you know it's like with a camera um i think lastly very quickly this is our latest uh, work inspired by these beautiful um, long exposure photography web uh, um, from the 1940s where a live photographer um, went to Picasso's studio for 15 minutes and um, uh, uh, got Picasso a, a, a torch and did asked him to draw sculptures like light sculptures into into space and we wanted to uh, and he did and they're incredible drawings incredible photographies of drawings and we wanted to develop a, um, a sort of more, much more accessible, much more broadly accessible experience that would allow anybody to, um, to emulate that creative process. Whereas Picasso had to remember and imagine exactly where he had already been without seeing any trace of what he'd done to then see the full result in, in once the photography was developed, we wanted to come because we can basically nowadays, we wanted to compress the development process of a photo into almost real time to allow people to sketch and draw um, in, a, in a sort of semi-augmented space. This is our head of technology, Nikos, um, in a semi-augmented space. So you have a large screen which displays your body and you can draw with light only with your hands. You don't need a torch or AR markers or anything or, or, or some sort of motion mocap equipment. It's just you in front and it tracks your extremities, maybe a, a hand or a, or a foot or something. And this is this was the, the first sort of iteration of this was um, prototyped and performed at during freeze together with Superblue um, for Brookfield's properties. Um, they, um, we had fantastic dancers from the New York Theatre Ballet um, and a fantastic live score from a, an incredible musician and composer called Lester St. Louis. Um, and they basically were asked to, to, to learn this as an instrument, if you like. Uh, and this is the, we haven't got the sort of full capture of the, of the material yet, but we got um, some films from sort of Instagram capture from New York. Um, and, um, and this gives you a quick idea of, uh, of how that's going to sort of develop and how that was performed in, in New York about a week or two weeks ago. Not sure, I don't think you can hear the, the score. I can... So here he's drawing with his foot and his uh, and one arm. And the whole thing is filmed with a, with a, a 3D depth camera, so it takes the whole body and then tries to tries to stay stay on, on your extremities. Uh, sometimes it's losing the point because you have your hand behind your head or something, but it's it's getting more accurate by the by the week at the moment. Um, so is it learning his body, so to speak? I think it's more like those. I think I think the. I think they they had to learn. Can you guys still hear me? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, I think they had to learn. They had to learn this almost like an instrument. Mm. They, they, they were drawing literally with their full body, and that's why it was. I think that the, the long term sort of the long game is to make this very accessible to the general public. But I think we're, we're, we've been very happy to have professional, professionally trained performers there um, to show us and, 
and the world how, how it, what, what's possible, what can be done. Um, I think for, for the general public, you will probably have your right hand tracked because that's the most intuitive way of, of doing this. But here we, we felt it was a bit more interesting. Um, yes, to, um, kind of a, a sort of absence presence. It's sort of displacing the body and yet making it present to us at the same time. It's, um, yeah, really intriguing. And I think that's it. Yes, that's it. Looks great, guys. That's a really compelling last image, actually, that you okay. put on. <laughs> Simon, did you want to um, follow up straight away with your images, or how would you like to? Um, well, I well, first of all, I'd like to continue by congratulating uh, Random with their with their output for the past couple of years. I haven't really uh, seen that much since uh, everybody dispersed out of London, but it's it looks great. Really, congrats! It's uh, really nice to see how you know, taking this idea of practice and exploration further. And it looks wonderful, and I'm really impressed how you're able to do so uh, over such distance. So, hats off for that. <laughs> um, I've, I haven't really, uh, like, like, like I mentioned, I haven't really prepared like a sort of a linear, like a presentation or, or, uh, or anything like it uh, as such, uh, as I was expecting it, you know, just to be more of an open conversation about drawing, but maybe to introduce very briefly, um, sort of, uh, my, my practice is, uh, uh, sort of my background is in, in uh, three dimensional and, and, um, and film and my practice is mostly about trying to, um, find a, a meeting point of those two and to try and uh, most of the thematic of the work is about sort of amplifying leftovers of, of nature in, in, a, uh, in response to an increasing man-made um, world that we live in. And a lot of it is about making mechanisms that uh, reveal or, 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 or unravel or research a certain hidden essence of a space so I uh, thought maybe just to mention in a sense of this is a drawing conversation that it's, uh, that I like, I draw a lot and I, 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 I use drawing a lot in my process, but eventually what my works are doing uh, are um, uh, basically uh, uh, mechanisms that draw, that let a certain space or situation draw out uh, its, its, its own hidden character or its own quality or its inherent quality. Um, and I think that that's an interesting thing about drawing, which perhaps has um, some uh, overlap with the, with what I'm seeing from 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 random here. Um, maybe I, I can show. I you know you can try well try and show a couple of things as um, maybe just to yeah, it'd be lovely to just just to you know see a few examples. Show people. I don't crash them. The, is this working? Great, yeah, that's... Yeah, oh, yeah, so I think most of my sort of well-known, so basically kind of the backbone of my practice is a very long-running pro project called, called Light Weeds, which I started in, with, with, in 2004, which is basically a, a, a software in which I try to find a, um, a combination of coding and, and drawing uh, and then seamlessly integrate this into uh, uh, public spaces or, or the built environment. Um, basically, it's, it's a digital organism that, that lives by uh, directly affected by the, the nature that's passing outside. So uh, it, on the roof of the building, I put sensors that measure wind, that measure sunlight, measure precipitation, that measure um, uh, air quality and things like that. And it streams that inside to the computers of the, uh, where the organism lives in. And what happens then is what I basically do is I, I, I research and look at plant life and, and, and reduce them to their, you know, to their essential being and describing code in numbers, how, uh, how big they grow, how, uh, how, how long they live, how they flower or how they blossom or, or how they pollinate and, 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 and how that works. And, uh, and to basically describe that in a code um, and uh, uh, that code is sort of gathered in a supposedly like a digital seed and that falls into that uh, uh, um, the, the ecosystem, the, the, the projected ecosystem. And the seed falls in and 
it sits there and it does nothing until the, the, the data from sensors outside um, create the mathematics that makes this plant grow up depending on uh, the, the, the actual situation of that day in that location. And the point of that being is that uh, to create a, a sort of an artificial entity, which is completely natural. Chicago is a fascinating oh, city. I'm sorry, I wasn't expecting It's fantastic to be celebrating the friendship sorry. between the US and the Netherlands um, in this special place. We're here to intensify the Netherlands loud, relationship suddenly. with Chicago <laughs> and Illinois. Yeah. And there are countless opportunities. Um, now lost. Yeah, um, um, and, and the point of that is to to uh, to to create an entity that is um, uh, not defined by me, but drawn by the space itself. Like uh, the, the plants pollinate only when people pass and use the space that they live in. Uh, so if there's no people, then uh, the plants will simply die out and, 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 and will be there. If there's no wind, the plants are completely still. And if there's no sunshine, then they will grow or grow very slowly and, and rain. So it's about, uh, I suppose, in a drawing sense, it's about giving uh, the pencil to, to the building and letting it draw out the way that it, the way that it functions. Um, and I've been showing this piece uh, so 50 or 60 times uh, over the past uh, almost 17 years now. So it's, uh, and it still grows by, by every um, um, uh, installation as in that I, for, for site specific pieces, try to work with local plant species and, and try to work with local uh, biological aspects that, uh, that affect uh, plant life. Just trying to scroll through some pictures. Um, so, sorry yeah so is there a kind of is there an environmental philosophy underpinning this work or is there you know just thinking so much about what all of you have raised really you know these sort of ethical and uh, questions and questions about um you know not leaving a trace i suppose um making them up but not leaving a trace so i just wondered you know does is there that sort of underpinning for your well, I think this is uh, an interesting point because sort of drawing the way you describe it is kind of say, saying that it's something that has a start and an end and a fixed outcome, whereas what this work specifically is about, and I think this idea of drawing, is that it's about a continuous process, like, like for example, like nature itself, if you, you, know, if you have a, a, a path in the forest, you know, sometimes it will be snowed over, sometimes it will have imprints from foxes, sometimes it will have uh, little uh, leaves on it in the autumn, and it's like an ongoing drawing. If you so if you were to regard it as an image, it's an ongoing drawing, and 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 this is exactly what I'm trying to do with my with my works is to to try and bring that um, sort of that that these sort of natural coincidental elements and, and overlaps and sort of synergies of how people use a space and how what local. Um, aspects are, are, are specific to that site and, um, and, and make them tangible again and, and to, to basically let the space speak again about, um, about what it is and, what it, and, and how it's being used and its, and its inherent qualities. Because my, my view on that is that it's, this is a lost um, element in the, in, in, the, in the sort of modern world, in the built environment where there is no traces anymore of how people use the space. Most um, most buildings don't show uh, it, who's been living, who, how the, the building is being used anymore, except for the old um, chewing gum sticking on the, uh, on the pavement. It, it is designed to not show signs anymore. And, um, and I think in, um, uh, in, in, in addition, like a, adding a layer of in the word, like, like in this piece uh, is, trying to um, create an ongoing drawing of it. And I think it, in terms of drawing, maybe it's this, like, I don't know if you can see the video stream, but it's, it's a bit, I, I find it's, it's quite an interesting way of trying to, to combine just written code with, uh, with graphic drawings, because you sort of, in the end, need a, a visual outcome, I suppose, of something. Um, I'll go on a bit more quickly. Um, it's amazing to see these life forms sorry it's amazing to see these life forms and actually i was struck when you the, the sort of with the first images how how evocative they they were of dance actually since we were looking at you know dancers and actually the movements and the sort of you yeah. know they, grace don't they 
Yeah, it's just it's funny. The, the first um, installation of the of the work in New York in in two thousand six, uh, the year before um, MoMA acquired the piece, um, it was the the left picture here. Um, that's uh, Mears Cunningham's dance studio, and um, and 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 every day the dancers would come out of the. Um, out of the studio and and dance in the in the leaves that um, that that rolled out when you, when you walk through them. The idea of the tree being that that every time somebody um, um, somebody passes the tree, one of the leaves breaks off and falls to the floor and creates this sort of ongoing mapping. So, uh, if you like, of of how that space is being used. Um, and yeah, that's yeah. In terms of dance, that's maybe a, a, a meeting point. But I've tried to. Um, I mean, I've done a lot of works in, in, that, in that sort of train of thought and, and with that purpose, I suppose, in, in, in different ways. Um, maybe this is like an outer shade is a piece I, I start, started as a commission for the, for the Art Institute in Chicago. And it's kind of the same, using the same thematics about how can we bring back the sense of coincidence and of, uh, um, of, of, uh, of the unplanned, bring back the unplanned back into the sort of staticness of, of the built environment. And here it's a, a glass surface, which is sensitive for wind that passes on the outside. So um, as, as wind passes any of these triangular cells, the, the cells become clear and, and therefore let through sunlight. And the, the projection or some kind of scopic projection of sunlight that you get into the space then, which is completely defined by that location. So that in a sense that the wind is always evolving, picking up and laying down, and, and, and the sun is always shining from a different angle. So sometimes very graphic, sometimes very ambient. And it creates a play of light, which I'm not drawing anymore. I haven't animated anything in it. But the space, I let the space draw, draw out its own quality. It's, it's collaborative, essentially, isn't it? Excuse me? It's, it's essentially collaborative with the space. Yeah, 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 it's, yeah. yeah, yeah it is. It, and I think it's, uh, um, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a complete dependency. And I think, um, and I think that's something, yeah, sort of thinking about drawing, I, I sort of try to look at my, my own work through the, through the glasses that you sent me, uh, by asking to join this conversation, I suppose. And I think drawing is maybe uh, that, that, that open, you know, for, for, for interpretation, like, like letting, letting the space draw or, le or letting people draw. Um, this, uh, by the way, is this the, the, the second showing of the, of the, of the work when um, the v &A opened its uh, uh, um, expansion uh, two years ago. Mm. Um, uh, Shade was the opening exhibition of the, um, of the new gallery and it, in a completely different setting where there was much more about um, uh, much smaller windows but much more space uh, which creates a very different effect to the light and I think it's um, yeah I suppose an evolving work uh, as well as light weeds um, for that. Um, maybe the piece that um, that you wrote about and started about. Um, like, uh, I've always been so sort of very fascinated about, about water in general, like how it's sort of like a, a, a very natural element in, in this, how it sits in the city and how it changes light and how it changes color. And I think um, the work probably stems from that uh, inherently. Um, this is a... Um, 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 uh, water drawings essentially uh, uh, small organisms that get drawn inside the volume of water, and um, because of the, uh, the, the the nature of the, of the, the temporary nature of the pigment, and because of the fluctuating nature of uh, the body of water, the um, the organisms sort of grow up and uh, temporarily exist in the water, and then fade out again. Um, in a kind of sort of seamless or endless, I suppose, uh, flow of, of, of drawing. And I think it's maybe even more so about temporary drawing, if, as you just mentioned. Um, this is a mesmerizing. It, yeah, this runs on for quite a while, so I don't, wanna, I don't wanna bore you with it, but it's, and I think what is, what I find interesting, and I guess uh, Random must feel the same thing about, is that when you start looking for, for these waves of, uh, 
of exploring materials and and this is something i do a lot in my practice like looking for 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 ways of not just relying on on uh, on existing sort of situations or, or or ways of showing your work like, like dance or theater or, or, or paint or brass or any material but just trying to look for um perhaps other ways of drawing as well and i think for me specifically it's about trying to find the um sort of an almost seamless integration of of the of the of the medium and, and the story of the work so so the i suppose the the creating the TV as well as the, the image uh, that's playing or the movie that's playing on it. And by doing that seamlessly, like for example, uh, Shade, as I just showed you, I think it, it, you get a very interesting spatial uh, reality, which is something that I find very interesting in, in exploring. And then coming, bumping on to things like this, it, it's, um, it's quite interesting because you're looking at something that is you haven't sort of seen before and it has a, Volumetric quality is a quality of light. Like for example, as you see here, you can project light through it and it becomes a projection and it becomes uh, almost a three-dimensional temporary drawing in, in the water, which you can walk around and you can see it from different angles. And it becomes, you know, it asks so many questions of your interpretation of, of, of the material. And um, I, I guess it's quite an interesting uh, um, aspect of it. And, and therefore, it, creating these kind of works, which I perhaps uh, seeing random do as well, you start with the piece and it doesn't mean, the first iteration is, is <clears throat> you know, you, you've come, come to a certain sort of first step of the work and then lay, lay it down for a couple of years maybe and pick it up again. And, uh, and as you have a different understanding of a certain methodology or, or a certain, uh, I don't know. It, it's it's um, it's an evolving thing for sure. And this the the, the second iteration of the of the piece, uh, almost six seven years after the the first time I showed it in in Miami in 2013, um, you have to think of very different ways of drawing and different meanings of of, of what what an, uh, a presence or or, or a manifestation like that could could mean. So um, yeah, yeah, drawing I guess. <laughs> and as you as you look to the future, you know, as all these technologies evolve, do you still see a role for the human? I mean, that so many of these works are about um, the interaction of, of human passing through space, or um, or but I but yeah, I wonder, you know, is it, is there a point when the human is entirely evacuated as the technology takes on an agency of its own? I, I wonder. Well, I I, I don't I think. Well, obviously, there, if, if, if there's no humans left, there, there, there won't be anybody to re remember or feel sorry. So, so that's not so interesting. But I think in between that and, and now, I think there is an interesting question to ask ourselves, like what, you know, what, what, what we want with all this technology and what, what we want with this sort of uh, almost sort of sterile and clean future technolog technological dream that we're, that we're sort of chasing. Like... <clears throat> And if all the ways of life and and um, and that we are now creating and, and how we're planning our public spaces and how we're planning our work life and um, like if, if there is um, you know questions to be asked of that like how uh, how how human how humane is it how how nice is it to be in a pod. Uh, which is always has the same temperature, always has the same lighting, and and it, and it nothing ever changes outside uh, what you decide to change out of it, which I suppose is the the, the ideal future dream. Mm -hmm. um, and it it obviously it, it's it's uh, the closer you get to ideal, the the further away you get from it as well. So um, yes, it raises all sorts of. Yeah, I I, th I think that we will see a. Re renaissance of the man or human or woman made um, of of the actual hand drawn of the handmade of the and it it might just be more the idea than anything else but I think um, certainly I can speak on on w within our practice um, we're, we're we're just working on one 
uh, one work where we contrast the, the, the sort of cold machine made and I think often perceived as deficient way that machines read and draw us. So we, we're setting these, the, 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 I think nobody thinks, or very few people think that, that they're correctly understood by the machine, mm. that our data is being interpreted in a manner that we appreciate or that, that, that fully sees us. And I think we're, um, we're going to see a rebellion, not in an aggressive way, but perhaps we, we, we do, we will, I, I think, come to appreciate the, the faulty. And it, it, it might just be the, the humanly deficient because it's, it's man-made. It's, it's, it's almost like a triumph of what makes us human. And it might be the last bit that survives in all this optimized efficiency overdrive. Um, so I, I see a great future for that, for these organic ephemeralities, for 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 hand sketch, for paint it, for for the for the warmth, because that's what we're trained for millennia to to perceive as familiar. We like that, and I think we will. That, even if it's just the idea, you know, if, if nobody knows whether it's actually handmade or you can't, even if the AI can make something that you can't distinguish from, uh, from, from, from a human made object, the, the fact that somebody says, but I made it. And if that's the last thing that distinguishes it from the machine made, will 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 give it the edge, I think for a while. There's like this, a bit the sort of early adopter sort of excitement Woo! it's a robot it can sketch like a human being but that's it's so dull you know it'll it'll wear off i think mm. it's perhaps a little bit about trying to at least for me um, what i'm trying to is it's about sort of trying to find the 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 main part of technology and and uh, and, the, and the and the natural part of that that drives it and what you can do with it because essentially Technology on itself is is utterly boring. There's nothing interesting with about technology except what you do with it. And I think that's something. Um, obviously, there's a sudden rush, and I think especially for our generation of, of uh, Flo and, and Hannes and, and mine, when when there's suddenly a lot of technology technology on our palettes, which because we're sort of growth of this internet generation where, where you can explore and find out about these things quite quickly without having a, a complete uh, technical or, or, or background or, or, I think that must have been very different um, um, you know, 10 years before us. And, it, and I think it will be very different again 10 years after us. But, um, um, I think looking- It is already. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's yeah, so 20 years after. <laughs> I keep losing track of time. <laughs> but um, the, 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 the the main driving element of it, I think that's that's the point of it. Thank you. Well, I, I, I I'm noticing um, some questions from our from our audience, and and um, do feel free, everyone, to 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 to, um, to ask questions. As, and you can always speak directly if you'd like to raise your hand virtually. Um, then if that's easier. Um, but yeah, there's just a couple of, I suppose, more sort of technical questions. There's a question about how you feel, um, Simon, I think, well, both of you, uh, all oh. of you is about um, creating permanence um, through the filming documentation. Oh, I feel terrible about it. <laughs> yeah, I think none of these pieces are, I mean, all of these things are, are to most people, the first time you see this, the first time you see uh, it's like the same for Raman's work. Like it, it's a, a dimensional spatial experience of light, which is terrible to capture in movie. It does not, um, it, it just does not translate well. And that's why I've, I've, you know, I've, I've always dreaded the idea of, of having this, you know, presenting these things on, on the web or, or, uh, um, or whatever. And it, because it just doesn't really, <clears throat> you put a tree on a building, if you meet it, it's, you, you bump into it in a city, it's such a, a completely different experience than when you see it on, you know, on your phone, it, it's, it's not, um, I don't know, just, it's very hard to communicate. And I think, I, I guess it must be the same for, for random, a lot of these things that are really about a certain um, experience or a very specific experience of light, it's just, 
even as beautiful as all the images are, they just the actual thing is uh, is so much more powerful. Uh, Ex expediently, I'm grateful for every single new generation of iPhone that comes out that gets a bit more sensitive to light, a bit closer to the to what the human eye can actually see. Um, so, and and I think in terms of being able, it's it's. I think especially filming is is um, um, because most of our work is in in, in some way time based and in movement uh, it's and, and and translates best the interaction between man and human and machine and I think filming I'm, I'm grateful because otherwise it would be very hard to uh, share this and I think that's something something we're, we're very um, very happy to do and very interested in doing to, sh to to broaden the debate about these topics with with this kind of work and that's really hard in just for example just photography and print there's this this occasional money shot you know in terms of like a really strong photograph of something but which perhaps captures a moment but it will never capture the experience anywhere near that's that 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 to that you get closer in in, in film but I, I I think if anything the, the deficiency of documentation technology today has massively ramped up our appreciation of the human eye. Mm. Like the stuff we can see is incredible with these. Mm, thank you. Well, as we're, as we're drawing to a close, I just wondered if, if there are, you know, if there's anything that you would recommend to, you know, the students at the Royal Drawing School um, in terms of, I don't know, apps or things that you use in your process of experimenting and drawing. Is there anything that's kind of accessible for someone just- Oh, I got, I got a really good one. It's like, an, it's, <laughs> you can see, it's great. It's from uh, Fitzpatrick here around the corner. Um, it's made with, um, uh, oh, sorry, I'm, there's the camera. <laughs> one pound, six B, nothing wrong with it. Well, they've all got one of those. <laughs> Um, Dutch traditionalist. <laughs> Start with one. Yeah, Apple are, you, are you endorsed? Oh, I should have known it. Is this um, um, Stuart? Uh... No, it's not. No. <laughs> it's just it's it's just, we have to pay for this stuff, unfortunately. But um, I think I think the the um, I think what's really fun is the. Is, is when you start draw, you know, expand this idea of drawing from paper into, like, into into the real world, into the physical realm, and then start to introduce time-based components. I, I love all these kind of. I don't know if you know them, but the, the, the I think in the same time frame, two thousand six, two thousand seven, there was this incredible street artist who painstakingly did one huge mural, photographed it, and then drew a second, like wiped it off, drew it, off, and he made these incredible animations, which of course nowadays would be un unbelievably successful NFTs, I guess. But I think that kind of, exp like this going out there and drawing, using the world, um, to Stefan Zagmeister does that incredibly well. Um, I think that's a very, very, um, you know, re really re reinventing the idea of drawing. I think there's nothing wrong with with the 6b or the, the apple pencil or you know th those sort of or that but the actual drawing has to look different today than it looked 100 years ago so i, I think you know pushing that that idea and taking it out of like in innovating with materials and processes canvases um tools i think that's the, the that's what i would definitely encourage and and then call it it's your it's your call, call a drawing, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's it was, it was fascinating to see the, the, the sort of, you know, public space becoming like a canvas and with the pendulum. The sketchbook. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, we draw to a close, but thank you all so much for, for sharing your practice and um, ideas and sort of introducing us into this, this really fascinating, evolving field. Um, yeah, thank you very much for, for being. Thank you. Thanks for having thank us. You. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs>